welcome everybody to uh, and good morning. Uh, so um, today we have a new uh, seminar in our Quantum Portuguese in Initiative uh, lectures. And, uh, and we are very glad to host today Professor Paivi Torma uh, from the Department of, of Applied Physics in Alto University. And it's, uh, it's really a great pleasure to have her here today because uh, Professor Torma has made uh, important contributions to several of the topics we address in the, with this quantum with this quantum uh, ser uh, series of seminars, right? So um, first, let me um, uh, introduce uh, her career a little bit. So uh, Paivi obtained her master's uh, from the University of Hulu in Finland, and also a master's from Cambridge University. And then she completed a PhD in, uh, in 1996 from the University of Helsinki. And then after that, she moved as a postdoctoral researcher to Ulm and, uh, uh, and, and Innsbruck University. And right after that, she was already uh, a professor at the University of G. Baskaila, if I pronounce it correctly, uh, for science uh, 2002 and until 2007. She has also been, I guess, a professor at ETH in Zurich in 2015. And um, and, uh, and she has also been head of several uh, research centers, including the Nanoscience Center of the University of uh, Jivaskaila between 2002 and 2005, and also the finest center of excellence in computational nanoscience between 2014 and 2017. And she's also um, an academy professor of the Academy of Finland since 2017. And she has also been vice chair of the board of the Academy of Finland between 2010 and 2014. So um, she has been awarded uh, very prestigious grants, uh, including the EU RYI uh, award in 2005 and the ERC advanced grant in 2013. And, um, and regarding her research, she, she has, as I say, made very um, important contributions um, to several fields uh, of importance for this uh, seminar, uh, for our uh, our seminars, and, um, and several others. And I would like to stress uh, her work in uh, quantum geometry and superconductivity uh, in the search for uh, super, uh, to explain why flat bands can carry supercurrent, which is essential for superconductivity at uh, room temperature. And uh, also uh, very relevant and where I think um, uh, we'll hear more about uh, today. She has made very seminal work on uh, a strong coupling between uh, surface plasma polaritons um, and molecules. And in particular, her group was the first one to demonstrate uh, Bose-Einstein condensates uh, using plasmonics. And uh, so with this, uh, I'm, um, I would like to reiterate that uh, uh, we are very glad that, uh, that Professor Torma um, uh, accepted to, to give us a, a talk today in the seminars. And uh, I would like just to remind uh, everybody, all the attendees, that uh, you can place your questions and answers uh, questions uh, later after the talk. In the and use the use the chat at the bottom, the Q and A chat, and then I will read those questions to uh, to Professor Torma. And with this, I will just uh, pass the floor to uh, to you, Paivi, uh, wh whenever you want. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, and thank you for the extremely kind in the introduction and also inviting me here. Uh, it's my pleasure to give a talk in this uh, Portugal Quantum Initiative uh, lecture series. I wish you all the best in this initiative, and there is uh, certainly a huge amount of things to discover in the quantum world. So uh, uh, let's begin. So indeed, uh, today I will uh, talk mostly, uh, actually only about my plasmonics related work. So uh, first, uh, I describe a little bit the type of systems that we are interested in, uh, because uh, I, I assume that the audience here is very, very broad from all uh, quantum uh, sciences. So I try to tell what, do, what can be done in this type of plasmatic systems. 
and and then I go to condensation and lacing phenomena and again uh, try to put our condensates to the map because of course there have been many condensates so far and where is then uh, this a uh, new type of condensate sitting and then I uh, do, uh, tell about the actual works we have first uh, achieved the BC in the weak light matter coupling regime and then also in the strong coupling one and have measured for instance coherence and found polarization textures in this species. So uh, first uh, background. So plasmonics uh, is a field that uh, studies light uh, interacting with metallic uh, structures, typically nanostructures. And um, there you can kind of bind light into dimensions that are below the free space wavelength. This you can do, you can see the Maxwell's equations by having actually the metal medium. And part of the uh, excitation is in the movement of the electrons in the metal, and part of it is in some kind of near fields close to the metallic object. So within this broad field of plasmonics, uh, I have been very interested in plasmonic lattices. They are this type of um, metal nanoparticle arrays fabricated by e-beam lithography. The dimension could be 100 uh, nanometers of this particle, for instance. And uh, as periodic structures, you can design band structures for light in this system. So here is an example. This is energy, and it's a transmission spectrum as function of the in-plane momentum. So in this talk, we are always uh, interested in the momentum in plane. And you see there is dispersion, band structure, and even a band gap. And uh, why these systems are uh, quite interesting from fundamental point of view is that you can bring the light matter interaction to extreme regimes because the nanoparticles uh, host very, very strong uh, uh, near fields close to them. So you can uh, achieve, for instance, a strong coupling uh, regime easier. And uh, another uh, great thing is that changing the geometry is extremely simple. So there is a lot to learn. And, and these systems work at the room temperature. And the modes uh, that exist in uh, these systems at the regime where uh, the nanoparticles are about one wavelength apart. So this is not really the metamaterials regime where you have many particles under one wavelength. This is the regime of when the spacing is matching the wavelength. And uh, you, you can imagine then that uh, there will be interference effects and uh, things that are related to periodic structures in general. And indeed, uh, this type of periodic structure, whether made of metal or something else, has diffracted orders. So we are interested in those diffracted orders. And one of them, the one that we are mostly interested in is the one, uh, this one here. And that's not the only thing, however, because these uh, uh, plasmonic nanoparticles have resonances of their own. They're called localized surface resonances. They have some resonance uh, energy. And you can think of them uh, as uh, little antennas that uh, you have an incident field can, that can excite this excitation and electron starts to go up and down here. And at the same time, there is radiation. So now this single particle resonance hybridizes with the diffractive order. That's just kind of funnel resonance type of phenomenon. And you will get a new mode. And that's called surface lattice resonance, SLR, SLR mode. So here, the broad uh, peak of the spectrum uh, is the single nanoparticle resonance, and this is what comes from the periodicity. So these SLR modes, we wanted to condense, for instance, or get lazy. And uh, they are uh, primarily light, but there is also this uh, small component of electron plasma oscillation. And they are dispersive. Uh, you can think about uh, exciting in an angle instead of a normal incidence, and then you can give some in-plane momentum to the system. And obviously, the diffraction condition is different, so the energy is different. That's why you have dispersion. And I already emphasized the band gap. You can have here a clear band edge. For instance, in the Bose-Einstein condensation, you need the lowest energy where you condense, and it is this 
and it's here. Okay, so uh, people have studied these uh, arrays for various purposes. And one interesting thing is to study the light matter coupling. So you can put molecules, for instance, on top of, of it uh, in polymer or solution, um, dye molecules or other organic molecules, and then study phenomena like lacing. So people have seen it, uh, many people actually in these arrays, and also condensation uh, experiments have become topical recently. And we have done much of that. We actually started by not doing lacing experiments, but simply putting the molecules uh, on top of the array and seeing uh, that light gets strongly coupled with these SLR modes. And then we went to lacing. So we have seen uh, various type of lacing phenomena. And uh, you don't necessarily need to uh, use uh, metal nanoparticles to achieve the strong coupling regime. We have shown in a recent work that you can do uh, the electric particles. They also have these localized uh, resonances, not as strong as uh, metal particles, but we were able to uh, achieve the strong coupling regime there. Okay, so that's the background uh, about the systems. And now let's go to the uh, condensation. So what can happen if you have a uh, multiple emitters, I depict them as two level systems here, and then something like um, some light modes that can interact with them. You can imagine here some kind of um, abstract cavity where you can have light modes. So, so there is a really uh, variety of different phenomena that can come up. And now it's important to discuss this because um, when I saw the BEC experiment, you're thinking, okay, how does it differ from lacing for it? So I like to uh, make this kind of triangle and thinking that we have beginning this two system. Uh, depending on whether you are in weak or strong light coupling regime or in equilibrium or non-equilibrium, you get different phenomena. So this axis is the weak coupling. And there, if it's totally non-equilibrium, you get textbook glazing and you can look at sigma. Now, if you go to this uh, direction, it's still weak coupling, but you go towards equilibrium, then you can uh, get a Bose-Einstein condensate of light. So, so you could uh, really look at this uh, quantum statistical concept. And then, you can increase the light matter coupling. And here I have the phenomenon of superradiance in these quotation marks because it's a name that is used for quite many slightly different things. So I won't go into it. But what is important here in the strong coupling regime is, is that there is full coherence going on in the, the system. So uh, with this cartoon, I'm now uh, telling you what is happening. In lasing, there was one uh, photon here, and now you see one atom went down from up to the uh, ground state, and you got another photon that is in phase. It's, this is lasing, you know it. Then in superradiance, you, similarly, you get uh, another photon, uh, but uh, now you really don't know which atom gave it. So you end up with this kind of superposition behind. And believe me or not, uh, this uh, lead to slightly different type of dynamics and the statistics of the uh, emitted light. Okay, then let's see how is, oops, B, C in this cartoon level. So there, the photon that you had initially gets absorbed and then it gets emitted again. And now you might be asking, uh, well, aren't we back in, in the square one? It's where we started. But you can see this is now red, this photon, and uh, not blue. And actually, you could not get this uh, equilibrium type of BC if you just have uh, two level systems. You need to have something where you have other degrees of freedom where you can dump energy. So, for instance, dye molecules, if they uh, absorb a photon before they emit it, uh, there is some vibrational relaxation and the energy of the photon goes down. And that's why I get the red photon. 
and then it repeats many, many times. And with this kind of uh, uh, cycles, uh, the light can thermalize, so to speak, and go to the ground state and converge. So uh, how then you see, I can see a difference between a BC and lasing one a thing is the distribution you expect a Lorentzian for lasing and in Bose Einstein condensation, the BC uh, distribution, which has this Maxwell Boltzmann tail from where you can get the temperature. And in our case, it's room temperature because the molecules that give this uh, thermalization are in room temperature. And uh, we have done lasing work I won't talk about it now. And then this BC, which is close to here, but I won't, I wouldn't say that it's full equilibrium. The time scales are such that we are not really in the version form textbook, for example. And then in a newer work, we are going towards a strong coupling. And of course, then this type of phenomena can start to show up. So this is where we'll focus today. All right. So then another way of uh, putting our condensates on the map is, um, is to compare to them to other condensates that uh, contain light. There are several already. You might know about the polariton condensates that have been observed in organic and inorganic uh, semiconductor materials. So there, it's definitely this uh, strong coupling hybrid of light and matter. Uh, that uh, is condensing. And then there are condensates of photon in, in, introduced by Martin Weitz, for instance. And the thermalization mechanism is uh, very different here with inorganic polariton condensates. Uh, there, uh, the uh, matter part are excitons and they scatter with each other. So this uh, can dump the energy and thermalize the excitations. While here in organic uh, world, it has something to do with the vibrational structure of the, of the molecules or the organic material you have. And uh, in these ones, it, it's like um, that you go uh, from the excited uh, state of the material to the ground, but uh, in such a way that you give actually the way energy by one vibration of quantum. And then in photon BC, it's this what I already explained that there are many emission absorption cycles, and in each one, you go down a little bit in energy. So, our uh, per, uh, first work was here, it's conceptually the same as the photon BC, but uh, the time scales are totally different, and the system is also different. And then this newer work at strong coupling regime, I think it's somewhere in between uh, this uh, known uh, thermalization mechanism. And then you might uh, uh, look also, what are the typical time scales in these experiments? So the photon BCs have been very, very uh, kind of long lived, while uh, then also, these inorganic polaritons, you can make them quite long lived, hundreds of picoseconds, while the organic materials are typically in the picosecond scale. And uh, that's where our work is also back. We, you will see in the new work, we really can uh, look at the sub picosecond uh, dynamics. And it's, it's like extremely fast uh, condensation phenomenon, you see. All right, so um, uh, after that uh, general introduction, uh, I will go to our results. And this is the first work. And uh, we had indeed this nanoparticle array and then uh, uh, dye molecules in a liquid combined with it. And then this picture tells very much uh, about the key uh, of the experiment. Uh, namely, it was very important that we pump the molecules uh, only on one edge of the sample. So, so the idea is that you give energy to the system, but at a very high energy, and then this thermalization process happens and you get the condensate. But we realized that it's very important that we have pumped it here uh, to demonstrate the phenomenon, namely, 
we knew from calculations that everything happens in a sub picosecond scale. So if we get kind of integrated emission from the sample and then look at it, we might miss the BEC effects, or we could not maybe tell it apart from laser. So we thought that, okay, let's pump here. And now the excited molecules, they emit uh, light to these SLR modes that live in this nanoparticle array, but they uh, emit it to such a high uh, momentum that uh, there will be propagation here. And now the excitations propagate and it, at each point, they also a little bit scatter out. So we can then detect what happens along the propagation. And this gives us uh, like um, access to time because earlier points on the detector mean earlier times. That uh, turned mm -hmm. out to be really a sense. All right, mm -hmm. so now to understand the concepts, um, uh, please bear in mind that we have this uh, band edge of, of the uh, dispersion, and this you can easily tune by changing the uh, periodicity of the lattice. And then we have a dye molecule with, uh, with a stoke shift, and this energy where absorption is uh, below um, typical uh, time scales, or like the uh, losses and so on, this is also important. We call it like an absorption end, something like this. And now this uh, is how the thermalization works. So we place the band edge here so the thermalization and the molecules are excited and they start emitting to the dispersion the SLR modes and then they propagate but along the way they are also absorbed again but before they emit again there is this vibrational relaxation so you emit to a lower energy and also to the band edge but now in this setting choice of this uh, position there is still some absorption left and you go to the lower branches so this is indeed what we see when we do the experiment. So this is spectra recorded along these different positions of the sample. So sample is like this, and this is the y-axis. And we start from high energies, then there is this red shift coming from the absorption emission cycles, and then this is the band edge, and uh, the population jumps over here. You can see it also from here, we have integrated what is in the band edge. Uh, there is something, but it goes down and the population is in the rest of the cloud. And now this, so we didn't get BC here, but see how the thermalization happens. And for the BC in this experiment, it was uh, important uh, to put the band edge to the same position as the um, molecule in absorption practically ends. So same story, emission, absorption, vibrational re relaxation, and then uh, emission again, but now there is very little absorption left. So you get this bos bosonic stimulation of all um, excitations to the same state. And indeed, you can see it here in the experiment. You start with the uh, red shifting and then when you meet the band edge, you get a very strong peak there. And uh, here you see how the band edge population grows and it's kind of fed with this uh, thermalizing cloud. So this is the BEC condition. And then a uh, nice feature of these uh, systems is that you can compare the lasing very easily. You can put the band edge well, well below to a position where there is absolutely no absorption, but there is some emission left. So effectively you have very high gain now. And then you see just lazing in the bandits, no red. So that's a nice way of distinguish this uh, BC and lazing. And of course there are also all kinds of other characterizations. I will not go into them now. I will just say something uh, very briefly what we did. So uh, we uh, measured uh, the spectra at this position um, for different uh, pump fluences. And, and we see that there is this kind of threshold behavior that after some uh, pump 
uh, threshold, we get the peak there. So this one, and this follows the Bose-Einstein distribution at room temperature. And we get uh, the same uh, from a rate equation simulation. Now, you might have seen uh, here that this uh, rate equation simulation is done in the time domain. And indeed, we don't have any propagating modes there. We just evolve the system in time. But still, it looks very similar. And that's uh, because our experiment was like this, that we effectively turn a distance into time. You can get the group velocity. And then it's a distance point corresponds to certain time. And indeed, this distance corresponds to about one picosecond. So, so this is also a method of seeing the below a picosecond dynamics in a very nice way. Okay, so uh, then I, uh, we wanted to go to the strong coupling regime where the SLR modes and the molecules form polaritons, new hybrid particles, and see whether we can condense those and do this, all these phenomena change and so on. And they actually changed uh, a bit more than we thought, I would say. So uh, to repeat, so we, our polariton is this uh, SLR excitation, which is mostly light, but also slightly plasmonic, and then the dimolecule excitations. And now we decided to pump over the whole sample. Even when this uh, pumping at the edge was so essential in the uh, weak coupling regime, but we wanted to see what happens if you do that. And uh, so this is a picture of that. And here just these pictures show that we are in the strong coupling regime because we get this bending of the dispersion. And this is what we see. And, uh, and the surprise uh, I told, was that there are actually two thresholds. So as a fun function of the pump fluence, the output uh, intensity behaves like this. There is one clear threshold, and then some kind of plateau, and a second threshold. And we realized uh, that this uh, first threshold um, corresponds to usual polariton glazing, so something that has been uh, seen also uh, in other um, plasmonic and organic uh, condensates that there is some kind of threshold and a peak and so on, but uh, no uh, signatures of the Bose-Einstein distribution. And uh, then here we see the BEC regime. So there we observe a very nice uh, Maxwell-Boltzmann tail. So we clearly have more of this uh, thermalization type of processes going on. And then these regimes, there is also intermediate one, they look very different. Uh, this is the real space image of the sample. So the uh, polariton lasing is essentially uniform. And it happens at one energy. So this is spectrum uh, and then the position in the array, like this. Uh, and the BEC has intensity mostly in the middle while this intermediate range has also intensity mostly in the middle. And here you see something like the thermalization probably going on. So you have uh, at different positions of the array, you have emission at different energies and it goes towards this uh, the bandits where you call it. So we wanted to understand this and made a different sizes of sample to see how what does it vary. system size, for instance. And at first glance, uh, it was even a uh, more confusing because the small, medium, and large samples, they look visibly different in the real space images as well as in the uh, spatially resolved spec. But then we uh, realized that this uh, so lower intensity area that we see in each uh, sample, that's actually the same for all lattice sizes. And from that, then uh, we concluded that we must have some kind of a stimulated uh, pulse formation process going on. Namely, if you have a very generic uh, stimulated pulse formation, it works like this. You uh, excite the system with some pump at some time, and you build up a population inversion uh, of, of your gain medium, and then it goes down and you create another pulse, output pulse. 
And this distance between these two points is called the pulse buildup time. And that only depends on the pump fluid. So we thought that if we get, get uh, from the edges of the sample, this kind of pulses building up, we will have a lower intensity he area here because nothing starts from outside the sample. And that should depend on pump fluid. So we varied the pump fluids and in all sample sizes that we uh, considered, this distance indeed, it varies linearly with the pump fluids. So in our case, this uh, thermalization is actually a stimulated process. And that's why it can happen super fast, actually in the time scale of something like a few hundreds of microseconds. Okay, so uh, then uh, uh, we proceeded to study in detail the spatial and temporal coherence, this PC. And uh, this is a very big question uh, overall because long range order of condensates in two dimensions is, is basically still an open question. In three dimensions, you, you should get a, a true long range order at the transition. And this has been actually observed in experiments. But uh, in two dimensions, first this Merwin Wagner theorem says that there should not be uh, any true long range order at finite temperature because of um, thermal fluctuations. But then we know that there is this PKT mechanism that by vortex anti vortex pairs that get a pair, kind of paired, you can have quasi long range order. So some kind of algebraic thing. But that's all equilibrium story. So here we and many others have this uh, uh, non equilibrium type uh, driven dissipative condensate. So what is going to happen there? There are various options. Uh, theories predict that in some conditions you could still have BKT mechanism, but kind of a non equilibrium variant. And uh, there are other theories that say that no, that's not possible, at least in certain regimes. You will instead have a dynam dynamical pace ordering, and um, then you will have decay that is a stretch exponential not uh, this algebraic. And different types of exponents have been uh, predicted for, for this. And possibly there is a crossover in this. So there is a lot of uh, interesting uh, physics to go on, but the experiments are very, very hard because uh, establishing power laws is extremely tricky. And uh, you would preferably uh, like to have uh, many, many orders of magnitude uh, change in your quantities to fit the power law, and that's uh, technically tricky. So we entered this um, uh, topic because um, we can, for instance, make rather large samples. So we made now new samples that uh, are not 100 times 100, like typically before in micrometers, but uh, this is actually a half a millimeter long sample. And uh, then we uh, study uh, spatial coherence uh, and uh, temporal coherence with uh, the Michelson interferometer set up with retro reflectors, uh, which has been used in previous condensate studies as well. Now just ours uh, was this really large size of the sample that made it somewhat difficult. So, so basically this uh, setup uh, splits your out, uh, condensate output into two and, and then it uh, flips <laughs> them in two directions uh, so that the, when you interfere them at the detector, then uh, uh, you will uh, basically see at the center of the image, you, you see the same position in the, like, like uh, put together with the same position. And then when you go away, it's like positions that are separated by the distance. And then this is how it looks like. So uh, you will, if there is coherence, 
uh, you will see interference uh, fringes in these images. So that's the measure of interference. And we see a very clear trend that below the BEC threshold, uh, this uh, fringes, uh, so Gaussian decay and a wall threshold, we get uh, much uh, broader, longer range coherence. And then we analyze it. So spatial coherence, uh, so uh, Gaussian, as I said, uh, above, uh, below the BC threshold. And you know, this is already the polariton lasing case. So it's still no longer it's ordered just a uh, Gaussian decay. And above BC threshold, uh, we get clearly something else. This picture maybe, uh, okay. Yeah, this tells the uh, root mean square error of different fits. So, because of course you can fit anything to these curves, but then you have to uh, look at the errors. So the Gaussian is clearly the best uh, for the low pump fluences. And then uh, below the, above the BC threshold, we get that either stretch of exponential or power law um, would be better. However, the exponents that we get uh, do not match any existing theory. So there, there can be something new going on here. And in the temporal decay, similarly, we see a very big difference uh, between a below threshold uh, where we see exponential decay. That's what you would uh, expect to see for lasers, with the shallow tones uh, uh, stuff. But uh, above BC threshold, we again clearly see that it's either stretch or exponential or power. So this is a nice system to study, this uh, BKT and KBZ uh, related physics. But uh, it seems that, well, basic message is that definitely the species regime is different from known kind of um, trivial lazing. But what is really going on? This uh, requires theory developments. And, um, this time of systems are a challenge for theory because we have uh, uh, many light modes and then the electric decrease of freedom of the molecules and the vibrational ones and everything strongly coupled. But this, I think, will be reachable within a few years in theory as well. All right, so then uh, briefly about the last uh, topic of what we have seen with these pieces. So, uh, so far, everything that I have shown uh, has been uh, basically scalar stuff. So we have considered one polarization. I didn't even mention what polarization we used. But uh, of course, this is light. So it's a vector field in the end. And we could exploit that degree of freedom. And um, how polarization works in these plasmonic arrays is very um, peculiar and somewhat different, let's say, from polariton condensates and so on. Um, so, so far we have had a uh, expolarized, this, this direction polarized uh, excitations and also the condensate. And uh, condensate looks like this typically that there is a more in the middle and this has been the polarization direction. And the polarization uh, works like this, that if you excite, a, the nanoparticles of the system uh, with this uh, uh, polarization, then the radiation is mainly in this direction. So you will get kind of a mode in the, um, you excite a mode that is in the opposite direction, your uh, polarization direction. So let's now do it a bit more complicated. Let's uh, allow the polarization to vary. And then uh, we enter a, a field of uh, spin or pseudo spin textures, which has been studied really a lot, both in classical and quantum vector fields. And there you get all kinds of topological defects and skirmians and whatever. And we went there by now doing polarization result measurement. So, um, we have, uh, after the sample, we have a polarizer that we can change and we can image one polarizer, polarization at a time. And also we used circularly polarized pump 
so that we wouldn't prefer X or Y direction. And this is what we got. And that was again a surprise. So uh, these two pictures up are what we would expect based on our prior knowledge that uh, this uh, in the intensity, highest intensity area here is like aligned with, with the polarization direction. So that's what we get. But then if you look at the emission that is uh, right circularly polarized, it comes mainly from the center. And then the left polarization comes uh, from the edges in this beautiful pattern. And also the diagonal ones uh, are quite funny. So now you can immediately think a bit uh, that right, uh, if I'm a right circular polarization follows this formula with uh, let's say pi here. Then if I want to go at the edge of the sample to left circular polarization, I would need to change the phase here. So it seems as if there is a phase change, the condensate or not. And we uh, started to explore this uh, by using a, a phase retrieval algorithm. So typically when people want to understand the phase of a condensate or similar thing, they do interferometry. But it's also very well known in optics that you can use phase retrieval. So basically you have the real space images uh, of your emission and also the case space images. And then, then you algorithmically uh, get out the phase because uh, real space and case space uh, are related by Fourier transform. And if there is a phase there, you can kind of retrieve it by the uh, algorithm. And uh, this is how the retrieved phase looks like. So there indeed is a pi phase shift between the central part and the edges of the array. And this depends on the polarization like how, how it is. And this all makes actually perfect sense, even when this look uh, very complicated here. Because we could make uh, this kind of very simple uh, uh, model of what is going on. So we just assume that, okay, we have both in uh, X and Y direction, a change in phase from uh, zero to pi um, across the array but in a different kind of here from zero to pi here from pi over two to three pi over two so that we will have in the center of this array the right circular polarization that we use for pump. And then we take also the fact into account that the dipole slightly go down in these arrays. And this simple theory is able to match the experiment. So we really get from there the same uh, beautiful patterns as from the experiment. So now we, we have kind of two proofs for the existence of the phase shift. One is this direct phase retrieval algorithm. And the other one is that when we assume the phase, we, we can uh, really reproduce the polarization result images. And we can turn all this into Stokes spectra also. Here we show the polarization components, but uh, now with the Stokes spectra, which is defined like this, if we have a constant phase in the array, we will not see much. It's very different from what we get from the experiment when we reconstruct the Stokes uh, vector there. But then if we assume the phase change in the theory, we get this thing which matches the experiment. And here, uh, when we cross uh, over one of these, uh, it's domain wall. So the polarization really binds there uh, as it does in the domain wall. But then if you go through all of this, uh, this whole circle, the domain wall uh, charges uh, uh, sum up to zero. So this one is not the topological structure, but it just has these individual domain walls. And uh, it's really uh, nice to see how, how this um, phase is correctly captured uh, by this phase retrieval 
algorithm because you really, if you uh, move, uh, let's say uh, along uh, one direction, you have to go. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so when you move along one direction, you get the minus sign either here or here, depending on whether you move in x or y. So that's why this left circular polarization has to be uh, with minus one phase difference with this one. So it all works very nicely. <clears throat> and then there is also a, a funny thing here. Those who, of you who might have worked with Fourier transforms, uh, you would think that, OK, I have here a intensity change in x direction. So therefore, if I take a Fourier transform, uh, I should have something that is extended in x, while in y, it's uniform. So it should be one block in y. But this is the other way around. But this is actually because in, in we have a phase change in the condensate. And it's, if you have a phase change here, then that will dominate. Uh, differences uh, or changes in phase uh, give a bigger uh, effect on Fourier transform than uh, changes in intensity. This is also a very known, well known fact. So that's why it's uh, oriented along this direction. Yes, so we have seen that we have a non uniform condensate phase there. Why we have it? Well, that's um, another story, I would say. But uh, this leads to very interesting polarization vector. And then if any of you became uh, interested in uh, modeling or looking deeper in this uh, nanoparticle arrays, we have a very powerful uh, T matrix code that is open source now. So anyone can go there, use, develop, interact with us. And also this paper is already published, but it's maybe easiest to find from archive. So there we come uh, to my summary. So we have seen uh, Bose-Einstein condensation in a plasmonic lattice, first plasmonic system, where it has been realized both in a weak and strong coupling regimes, and it has very fast uh, dynamics and spatial and temporal coherence properties are very distinct from lacing. And now we have also entered to the vector field plane. And the condensate phase that was uh, achieved by phase retrieval, that's the first time that any condensate phase has been determined that way. So hopefully this encourages others also to use uh, such system. And I, I would say that um, theory developments are now needed to really understand what is going on in this uh, extremely fast and strongly coupled systems. And I also want to go to the role of quantum geometry and topology in these systems in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, baby, for this very nice talk. Uh, so, um, so I will now open the the, the session for questions, and uh, well, people can write their questions on the uh, Q and A. But I will start uh, maybe with my uh, with a couple of questions <laughs> of my own. So, um, so I was curious on the um, so on most of your systems you use actually two um, two dimensional arrays, no? Of uh, mm -hmm. and they look like rods, no? Uh, at least in the first half of your talk, no? Uh, yeah, so, yeah. But you still have only one. Um, in your dispersions is always one single band gap, no? So, so, so how, if you are using a 2D system, I will expect the dispersion, the, the bands to be more complex, no? Than just mm -hmm. one single. So is that because you just pick up the right design or? or... Yeah, yeah. So first of all, we always look at two dimensional systems. Sometimes we use rods, sometimes particles. Uh, they don't affect so directly the dispersion, the particle shape. But um, of course, we have uh, the actual dispersion is in 2D space. We just don't show it. We, we mm -hmm. always say, like, show a cross cut. OK. <laughs> yeah, so, so it is more the 
Yeah, so, and we have some pictures. Maybe I should sometimes show them. But <laughs> it's like yep. more more work to produce those pictures. So we see so cross cuts typically along kx or ky. Hmm. Because I guess there there also should be um, strong interactions going on in those directions. No, so so there might uh, the analysis the same analysis could be performed in the in in a non uh, in the non y direction for example no? the... yeah 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 hmm. okay so um and and then uh, yeah another very quick uh, question i i, I had uh, i was curious uh, on this uh, very nice last uh, polarization text you saw the the um, so they look to me like if you might have vortexes somewhere and on those uh, on those um, on those maps. So, uh, have you explored that, or the, you don't have resolution for? I mean, um, so uh, in the middle, no. Comparing the two uh, polarizations, there are maybe degenerated uh, positions there for the, or or that's something that is not. Uh, yeah, not yeah. Um, it's true that we have these phase changes. So there could be maybe some vortices related to those. Uh, yeah, we have not systematically studied it yet, but I, I'm sure it's uh, possible to generate on purpose mm -hmm. some vortices here. If one just thinks a little bit how, how all this works. Yeah. <laughs> For instance, this is very simple theory that we have made. One can play with it and try to get vortices out. Yeah, but it's, it's uh, very amazing how 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 well it works, no? With a simple th the simple theory, but still it's, yeah, it's yeah. quite uh, quite well. Um, so okay, I don't know if uh, if we have oh yeah okay we have Joaquin raising his hand. <laughs> okay, I maybe yeah you can go ahead. Uh, hi, Th thanks a lot for your talk. The the system is uh, new to me, so. I'm I'm gonna ask some simple questions, maybe. Let me say that uh, I worked back in the day on, on the bus condensate of excitons, and I was very pleased to see how the, the issues that you were covering during the talk uh, were uh, already present 20 years ago in our, in our thinking about our excitons. But anyway, so, okay, I didn't, I didn't get what controls the, the, the critical temperature here for the Bose condensate, or in other words, what is the origin of the of the mass? Well, how do you control the, the dispersion of the the plasmas? I guess. Mm -hmm. Yes. So. Maybe here. Oh yeah. Okay. Here it's not very well visible, but. Um, here you can see that there is some kind of band gap created and so on. So uh, the um, curvature of the band gap, we can uh, control by the particle size and uh, shape because the uh, band gap is created as there are two um, counter propagating waves and they scatter to each other from the particle. So but the better scatterer, the bigger band gap. So that, that we can use for uh, shaping the dispersion at the relevant point and kind of creating an effective mass, if you wish. So that's, uh, yeah, where, where we get this uh, critical temperature uh, conditions. And of course, in our case, we, we always work at room temperature. So in practice, we um, change the density. So we have a critical density. And that's what we saw in this. As the threshold, and and I guess the reason why the the, the uh, critical temperature comes out larger than room temperature is because the effective mass is small. It's in turn, it's because yeah. the photon content of of these um, plasma polaritons is is large, right? That's, yes, yes. The photon content is large and. And you know, these straight lines are basically light dispersion mm -hmm. and there is only some deviation here from being just light. Yep. Okay. Right. And then the other thing I didn't get, what is the role of the molecules 
how is the how are molecules changing here uh, things? I mean, you mentioned them, they are emitting light and, and, and you show this diagram where photos go back and forth mm. between these modes and the molecules. Yeah. But uh, yeah, how, what, yeah, can you, can you elaborate on that? What, yes, what? yes. So the uh, role of the molecules is, is first to kind of give energy to the system. So we pump the molecules and they emit light. And then in the weak coupling condensate, they are like uh, your um, parts or reservoir with which you exchange energy. So, so you have these SLR modes, which are mostly light and a bit of plasma, and then, then the molecules absorb them and uh, put some energy away and emit. So, so that's like a reservoir. Then in the strongly coupled condensate, it's a much more complicated story because then the object that actually condenses is a polariton, which is a hybrid of the uh, SLR mode and the molecular excitation. So, and still the, the, they, they, at the same time, they are part of the object that condenses, but they also contain this vibrational manifold, which is the part that they can dump energy. So that's the case where I would say that uh, yeah, the full theory does not yet exist. So strong coupling would mean that somehow the, okay, what is going to be the strong coupling? The, the intensity of the pumping or, or, the, or, the, um, or the energy difference between the molecule uh, and the So strong coupling is because there, we have so many molecules. And also the uh, okay. load volumes are rather quite small. So it's not because we have like, a, a, it's not a kind of rubbish split that comes from huge uh, uh, intensity, but more like the vacuum rubbish splitting type of thing, but for many particles, many molecules. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Joaquin. Um, I think we have an, uh, another question from uh, Professor Mikhail Vasilevsky. Uh, I'm gonna then, uh, Mikhail, maybe you can you can you can unmute. I think you, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Martin. Um, thank you very much, uh, by the for for the nice talk. Uh, maybe you remember we met. Uh, some 10 years ago in Scotland, the European Optical Society meeting, but all this work mm -hmm. is posterior as I, as I realized, and very interesting. Uh, my question is, is uh, um, maybe a, a continuation of what Joaquin was, Joaquin was asking. Uh, maybe I missed it. How are the molecules distributed uh, over the, the plasmonic lattice? Uh, is it mm -hmm. random? or do they sit on the plasmonic particles? Uh, it, it's very random. If you um, look at this picture, it's trying to depict this whole uh, red disc here is a solution where, where, the, um, where the molecules are. So they are in solvent, in liquid. So, so they can go around. They are, in, in that sense, completely random with respect to the... Uh, uh, nanoparticles. Is there any any exit and exit and interaction in this system? Oh, I think not. We 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 have um, made some uh, theory estimations. Like when when would we get to the regime that? Um, well, uh, let me first say that these are the excitons are in separate molecules. So, so it, you can kind of think each molecule has one exit and so on. But of course, they could be so close to each other that you get like dipole, dipole, or exit and exit and interactions. But according to our and some other uh, theory estimates, one would need to have extremely large uh, densities of the molecules to achieve this regime. So I don't think this. Uh, this really is there. Actually, we wanted to study them, but uh, these very large densities uh, needed, they, they just made the molecules to aggregate. So could not, could not they, go to the regime where these uh, exit and exit and interactions would be 
So an exit and polaritons interact through the uh, through the uh, uh, surface uh, uh, resonance mode, surface lattice resonance mode. Is, is this correct? They interact through that collective electromagnetic field, which is uh, supported by by the lattice. Uh, this is how they feel each other. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Because the light field is kind of that spread all over, and that's why you start to get the statistical effects and so on. Okay, and uh, and John, maybe the last question. Uh, so your your uh, lattice, your plasmonic lattice, uh, plays the role of a cavity, uh, mm -hmm. so to say, a plasmonic cavity, and the, the, this. Plasmonic cavities are good for, for, for strong coupling because they, they can give you a very high uh, uh, fields, local fields, and then the, 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 mm -hmm. uh, uh, the parcel factor is, is very large. But in, in, in compensation, you have uh, uh, losses. You have losses. Yes. Uh, 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 can you comment on this? Uh, yeah, so, so the losses are there. Of course, now we put also gain because we pump the molecules and so on. But you can, uh, one can view it as a, a kind of interesting new regime because uh, you can see, for instance, BC dynamics as we have seen. You just have to resolve it in a very short time scale because there are, there are losses. So they, these are very good if you want to. Um, understand ultra fast phenomena and then if ever some applications come the the uh, time scales of the dynamics in these systems is in the picosecond or, or even faster scale so so it's a kind of uh, yeah uh, setting where you can do ultra fast dynamics thank you very much Vinny. Uh, thanks michael uh, actually uh, just continuing with that uh, question by Michael, uh, you, you saw at the beginning some examples using dielectric uh, lattices mm -hmm. instead of, uh, yeah. and there the losses will be uh, lower, I presume, no, because, uh, mm -hmm. because of the electric, but then you don't get such a high personal factors, no? Uh, uh, so what's the, so do you think that uh, that could be an, alternative eventually to metals because there has been plenty of research lately no, on this fully mm -hmm. dielectric yeah. or or is just uh, just in some cases that one can uh, that one that one can use those systems no uh, or yeah yeah it could be an alternative and it's definitely worth researching um, uh, our hope was a kind of a make a straight forward comparison that uh, which one is better, gold or these dielectrics. And we even mm. have uh, experiments for both cases in our paper. But then we realized that it's not straightforward to say which one is better in what sense. Because for mm. instance, if we do same size particles of dielectric and gold, then their single particle resonances will be at different energies. Mm -hmm. And this affects also the SLR mode line widths, uh, so you start actually with a different yeah. system. So, yeah. so even to really compare them uh, is um, it's not straightforward. Maybe you would need to have some kind of a definite goal and yeah. uh, then you just check which particles give you better this goal. Yeah, yeah depending even on the application eventually. No? Yeah, 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 depending on uh, the application. So yeah. I, there is no straightforward way of saying that this is better for that reason. And, yeah. yeah. Okay. That's, uh, um, so, well, as as we said at the beginning, is we have uh, if someone wants to ask more questions, just right uh, right there in the next minute. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, I will uh, just ask a very quick curiosity <laughs> because we, yeah, we we are already five past eleven. Um, so yeah, I have a curiosity on the actually on the on the on the measurements themselves, no? Um, so well, it's maybe just a, a experimentalist curiosity, but uh, so every time I see these interference patterns for for the for checking the coherency, no, in the in the mm -hmm. condensates, 
and I realize the objective lens is is not such a high magnification objective lens. No, I mean the resolution is not is not so high in the optical system. Let's say no, uh, and uh, and I will expect the pattern. Maybe it's a bit technical, but I will expect the 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 the, the, the oscillation to be measured with higher resolution, the highest the resolution of the of the optical system. I don't know if I explain it myself with mm -hmm. <laughs> with the question, but uh, so yeah, uh, yeah. You 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 saw then 10 x no ten 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 by magnification no yeah yeah not such yeah. high. So is is this um, has to do with the resolution in the actually in the in the K space or of of the measurement or 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 there is no relation uh, really between the. So, so are you uh, asking the. Uh... What is the resolution of the fringes? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, because... um, mm -hmm. So here, mm -hmm. actually, one difficulty that we had in the experiment, which is not related to that at all, and which was kind of limiting, is that uh, we had this very large uh, sample sizes, and and then. Any in, imperfections in, in the alignments in, in this Michelson setup and so on, they start to make big effects uh, if your sample is very large. So we were mm -hmm. mainly fighting with that. So okay. uh, we didn't see that this, um, like the resolution of the optics, would have been. Okay, but this is the actual yeah, area then, yeah, which is yeah, critical, but of course, right? okay. There is something, uh, maybe which one would be best to show it. It's of course this, that um, when you fit something like a power law or something, it becomes the more reliable, the more, uh, you know, dynamic range you can cover. Mm -hmm. and, and then if you could uh, measure here, which is below our noise limit, that of course would make the fit much more reliable. So in this sense, mm -hmm. uh, yes, if you can put your noise limit uh, down, that, that will be very advantageous. Okay. Okay, yeah, that's very, <laughs> very interesting. Yeah, that's, uh... okay. So I think then if we don't have um, more questions, maybe we can, uh... We, we can then uh, close here the, the seminar with 10 after 11. So I would like to thank you again very much, uh, Ivy, for, for this very nice talk. And uh, I'm sure um, everybody in the Quantum uh, Portuguese Initiative Lectureship has enjoyed it a lot. So thank you very much for, for the talk. And, um, and we, well, um, everybody keep uh, tuned. We will be advertising soon what uh, uh, what will be the next uh, sessions on the on, on the sem on the lectureships? Yep. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you bye. for you. Thank the, you. This was really nice, and thank you for the lively discussion afterwards. Okay. Bye bye. Thanks, bye. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Bye. -bye.